This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We'd start off tonight with a question that allows Pietro to talk a little bit about his general perception of what's going on in Mexico. So the question I'd like to ask you, Pietro, and Dia alluded to it in her introduction, is the question of war. And, and what are we talking about when we talk about a war in Mexico? We often talk about you know, the war on drugs. And we talk about forms of violence that we normally associate with an armed conflict forced disappearances, we talk about heavy weaponry, we know that the Mexican military is involved in every aspect of law enforcement these days. But when it comes to invoking the responsibilities that go along with armed conflict, dealing with refugees humanely, providing some kind of humanitarian assistance, protecting non-combatants and civilians, none of those triggers seem to get flipped. We don't seem to actually acknowledge that there's an armed conflict in Mexico. And it's a difficult question. You know, Dee mentioned the thing that, about Mexico, the homicide rate. And the homicide rate in Mexico is lower than it is in many countries in Latin America. And yet there are all these other indices that, that, that hint that there's something like a war going on. So the question I want to put to you is, how, should we, you know, how can we talk about a war in Mexico? And why is it important to talk about there being a war in Mexico? <laughs> Too much words for my little brain <laughs> and too little time, but uh, and also very faint and happy to be here. And uh, I've been here in October last year with Margarita and some other friends uh, in a meeting of peace educators of all the country. After El Hibri, mm -hmm. we went here. So um, it's a place that calls me with good energy because it was a good time, that workshop we did here. I learned many things from people here. I will try to speak Spanglish. Uh, I only speak English when I have something. Only when the you're on TV. Was in March. No, uh, I never speak English even one second. In my, with my child, he doesn't want me to help him in anything in English, in his le homeworks, so I never practice, but uh, when there are some words I need help, I will ask you and him not for making clear, uh, because uh, it's important for me to share something that is useful for your lives, not for your knowledge. Uh, it's not easy to leave things, leave the work, uh, the job, things, move even if for a few hours. Uh, so, for sharing information that everybody can have, opening a paper or newspaper, things like that, it doesn't have many sense. I would like to try to make some kind of reflection together, reflexion, no? reflection yeah. together of what we call in peace epistemology, that is what I like, or nonviolence epistemology, try to see what you can't see in the first moment. Uh, what happens in Mexico, in every reality, also in our families, in our lives, in ourselves, uh, is always uh, built by what we don't see that it's down. No, it's a kind of the root of the flower. We see the flower, but we don't see the root. What builds reality are the roots. And sometimes we fight against the flowers and we don't change things and we make things worse because we can't understand the roots of the problem. So in that sense, for me, uh, it's important to try to, to share some reflections that are not mine, are of groups of people about the roots of situations that are 
crossing our lives, particularly in Mexico. No? Uh, so it's important to have a good dialogue in the second part of this. No? Uh, also because that for me is important, um, I represent a culture, groups. No? For example, here are some companions of the peace movement no? that are very important and of other groups. So it's not a person. That would be a kind of magical thinking. I am completely against that messianic way. It's not one. It's a culture that tries to humanize the species. We think that our species is not enough humanized. Uh, many people don't know if they are going to eat tomorrow. More or less one of five doesn't know if he's going to eat tomorrow. We have genocides everywhere. So it's not easy to think that we are a very humanized species. Biologically, yes, but not culturally. So uh, we are going to, to share some reflections in that sense of many other peoples that uh, uh, add knowledge to this reflection. Now, that for me is very important because I never heard somebody speaking five minutes of me as she did or he, so I get a little bit. <laughs> It's only a kind of many people that are speaking with, with me now, no? And uh, I, I said him be before your question, that is very important and that will open, that um, for me, it had a sense of humor, the title of this conference, in, in my life experience. When I saw it, I laughed a little bit. In one sense, because it's in some ways the opposite we live. But in another sense, because I had, and here is a good place to say it, a very, very big teacher in nonviolence and in many groups in Mexico, he was one of the first persons that brought the word, the idea of nonviolence in the 60s in Mexico, that was Father Donald Hessler. He was a marinal priest. A very important uh, person in, in Mexican story of nonviolence, a, a Marinol priest from Michigan, Ann Arbor. He died there uh, on 95. And he always, when he spoke on, of nonviolence struggle, he said that it had two characteristics main characteristics. And he always took the example of a very typical Mexican believing that it's Guadalupe's uh, Mary of Guadalupe. Yes? No? La Virgin. Virgin. The Virgin. The Virgin. Guadalupe's Virgin. Because, of course, he as priest always had a, a foot in religious uh, life. The story, of, the story of the 16th century of Guadalupe's Virgin is very interesting. The story written by the indigents. Indigents, no? Indigenous. Indigenous. It's a very revolutionary story. It has a lots of things against Spanish people, say it in a very intelligent way. And he said, Guadalupe asked Juan Diego, the, 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 the indigent, the Virgin God asks two things. And uh, that are the two main characteristics of a nonviolent struggler. No? So he said, well, what? Be humble and have audacity. Those are the two things the Virgin asks all the time to Juan Diego, a little indigent that is completely afraid to go in to speak with the bishop and with all the Spanish authority. She could have gone herself with the bishop, but she never went with the bishop. She sent the indigent, because he should confront power, not her. That was God. So it has a lot of teachings of how to struggle. But uh, for me, it was very nice to to see in the title the word audacity, because we have uh, some experiences of audacity, nonviolent struggle in our city, in Cuernavaca, 
in the, the F.A. in Chiapas with the indigenous communities. And it's, a, it's something that surprises the adversary and that builds moral force in the group that challenges out power. So it's a good word, perhaps not the ideal in our situation where we are more in the defensive way than in a way of attack. But there are also situations of nonviolent attack now that we can speak. Well, I said what <laughs> I had many things in my head and uh, I wanted to put this a little bit clear for having more clearness of from which corner we will speak, no? Uh, in Mexico, uh, in this way of war and nonviolence, something very important that uh, I learned only more or less 20 years ago, I didn't know it uh, before. If you work in peace, we, you must know more about war. Oh, but while you are a, a violent person, you speak of war. No, it's very important to understand laws of violence and of war for building peace and nonviolence. That's, that is not, I think everybody knows. We spend a lot of time in our workshops and in our seminars of two years more or less is the time we spend in generally one year and a half trying to know more about how violence is built. War is one of the ways of violence. No? And that's the way of struggling and building peace with a real reality principle. That for me is a very, you understand the word? Principle of reality. is something uh, taken by Freud, Freud, mm -hmm. but applied to social sciences. Reality, principle of reality is what a little child starts the society getting inside the body of the child when you say to him, don't touch fire, don't cross the street because a car will pass through you. You know, there is a moment, one year, one year and a half, where the whole society starts putting orders in the body of the little child. Of course, before he's born, but in a more clear way. That is what Freud calls principle of reality. And uh, that it's the opposite of the pleasure principle that the child is growing. In a struggle, in peace education, in a non-violent, real struggle, not symbolical, real struggle, if you don't have a good principle of reality, it will be completely against a disaster. I saw that all my life. So, it's very difficult to build a good principle of reality based in hope and not in the illusion. We will throw down the government. Capitalism is increases and will be uh, thrown down. Yes, in 1,000 years, of course. But we can start doing some bad things for helping that. But it's not real. A bad principle of reality is the sure way to frustration and uh, to be beaten in a struggle. And in Mexico, that's your question and it's very important. Why you say, why we use the word war? Because it has two faces. Some people get afraid and get more terror. Being afraid is not the same of having terror. In the Mexican situation now, it's very important to be afraid. Who isn't afraid is an unconscious person, doesn't know absolutely what's happening. If I'm not afraid being here, I'm in a baby in struggle. But being afraid helps to get up the defenses, to understand how to speak and what to do. But being terrorized paralyzes and doesn't leave you think and that's very dangerous. So the word war has these two faces and it's important to use it well. But it's important 
to understand how the power, the government, and many groups, the churches, etc., hid our reality speaking of these abstract ideas of violence. These big words as peace, violence, war, without a surname, apellido? Yeah, with a last name. Without a last name, don't help to understand what's happening. Leave us more on defense against reality. So we always must put a last name to, the, to this big category. So in that sense, it can help more if you say, well, in Mexico there are some, you say acts of war, war actions? Acts of war. Acts of war, let's speak like that to start to understand. But that doesn't say anything. What we need is to understand how are these acts of war? What is this process? That's what we must understand. And you say, of course, in a country with uh, the government said last week, 25,736 disappear people till 31 January. 25,736 people. The main number of disappeared people in Latin America during the Argentine dictatorship of the 70s is 30,000. Mm -hmm. uh, so the number is absolutely uh, terrible. Peace Movement speaks of 130,000 people dead in the last six years. Some universities spoke last week, 281,000 people displaced. No? So you say, well, those numbers for, it's a, a deep discussion, no? but those numbers speak of a war that has one kind of characteristic first. There is a kind of mass extermination, massive extermination. I am speaking in a very general way. Second characteristic, very important. There is a target killing. How you say this? That's right, targeted. In Mexico, always there has been a targeted killing of social activists, journalists and people that work in human rights. It's the story of Mexico. There is a kind of floor permanently of this kind of elimination. But, and this is one of the interesting things to reflection with Ayotzinapa and with Iguala now, uh, this target sometimes increases. This is the moment. No? And we must ask why and to whom, which is the target, the social identity of the target. Now I will, after I say something about Iguala in this sense. No? In Guerrero, that is the state where Iguala is, the last four months of 2013, Iguala was September 2014, were killed 20 social activists, some of them of a high level, in the same state where eight months after were disappeared 43 young students and six killed. So you say it's a process. It's not a casualty as, uh, this, as a tomato that grows up and you say, oh, wonder, or a potato. No, it's a process. And if you want really to struggle in a non-violent world, we must understand the process, not the numbers, the, the, the final numbers. And I want to say a third thing important for passing to This kind of war in Mexico has a lot of civil characteristics. First thing important to understand, organized crime is the first employee way in Mexico, the first job in the country, gives the most high number of jobs in the country. 
So we must understand that we are in an economical problem, social economical problem, not in a problem of uh, madness or National University, where I have the honor of working, made a study in November 2011, Economical Institute of National University, and says that organized crime gives directly 600,000 of jobs, and directly millions, because if you build a mall, if you build a house, if you make a street, if you put a shop, who works there, who sells, the person that puts, puts the los ladrillos, the, the bricks, the, brick the bricks, those are indirect. You, I am, you understand this? But directly, you go to the corner and you see everybody that passes. You go and you do this. You go and you ask money to your shop every week for paying security. Those are direct jobs, 600,000. There is no other institution in the country that gives so much life. And I, there is something I do very often. I speak with everybody in the shop, in the taxi. You know somebody that has a kind of, um, they ask you money extortion, you say? Yeah. Disappeared, killed people. Practically, there isn't any person in the country that in his family, in his job, or in the building where he lives, doesn't know somebody that has been crossed by one of the three, four most big crimes in the country. I, it's more than years, I don't find anybody that doesn't tell me some story. So the, our situation crosses all the social classes and all the territories. But, and that's important, and I close with it because I spoke too much. Uh, yes, I am tired of hearing myself. I don't like to hear myself always, but okay, I understand. Uh, the way as work and war and nonviolence war works in every territory is different. And that's very important to understand. Because if you live, no say, I live in Cuernavaca, you say, oh, it will happen to me the same as Ciudad Juarez. You make a very big mistake. And the same, the opposite in other countries. So you must build a very good principle of reality of how war process is working in your region where your body is. Otherwise, you can't change things, and it's very risky. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, so, so maybe, maybe um, before we move into, I mean, I think we should talk a little bit about how you think this fits ah, into some, go ahead. Yes, one, only one sentence, very important. And uh, perhaps it's a bridge with Iguala. Okay. This is, I think, is important. We, what happened in Iguala made us clear what uh, lots of family activist movements for the last five, six years said with words all over the country about impunity and the association between government in all the levels, businessmen, organized crime, and civil society in every territory. And what happened is that what we discovered is that the image was more strong than the words. That's a very interesting thing that happened now, that broke something in the society. We saw with the cameras the students put inside the car of the police, of the municipal police. No? So that was said by thousands of family victims the years before. They told a lot of those stories. but. Always the media, the government, the journalists paid by the government change situations. Say, it's your word, it's my word. But now, all the people in the world saw the image of reality. War, drugs, is completely a lie. It doesn't exist. There isn't absolutely a war, how you say, again, I had the word, war on drugs. It's not true. What there is, is 
a war. I, I read a little sentence because it's my, within intracapitalist, inside of the capitalist, we are in a laboratory of a new way of capitalism, of stage. And Mexico is an advanced experience for the monopoly of control of illegal merchandise. You understand this? Or merchandise. Chinese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happens is this, in my words, because there are territories. In every territory, in every corner or many cities, there is a very strong battle for having the monopoly of the illegal merchandise. 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 Some uh, sociologists speak of 23, 24, 26 different kinds of crimes. Not only drugs. Drugs is 60%, but there is a 40% and it's a lot. So what happens is that there is a very big confrontation. Confrontation. Confrontation in a lot of territories for knowing who will have the monopoly. And in every gang, there is businessmen, government of all the levels, organized crime, and civil society, directly or indirectly. Of course, not the same bodies. One is in one gang, and the other is in another gang. So the, our, our population had a very hard truth in front. We understand that the state changed and the state won't protect us anymore. And the image of a state that protects, guards, respects some things is completely go down. For that, we have a very, very big crisis of legitimacy now in the country, in the parties, and in the elections. Because people saw with an image, not only with words, reality, that they were not in a war on drugs, but in a war between gangs and the government, it's deeply inside in all the gangs. Understand it? Yeah. Mm. So uh, there are two things I think we need to do that I think will give our, our audience good context there. One, uh, that I, where I think you have a lot of great insight too. The first is I think we need to humanize this just a little bit. You know so many of the individual stories uh, and it's such a, a prominent part of the movement that I'd love for you to share some of the examples, the stories of people who have um, been on the other end of this. Really, victims, familiaries, are the heroes of nonviolent struggle in Mexico today, absolutely. The way as they risk their lives, they do the research of the crime, directly going to speak with the gangs, it's really very dangerous, very clever, very courageous. It's incredible. I read last week, hace dos semanas, something of two, a couple I like very much from uh, Monterrey, Lucia and Alfonso Baca. It was in the paper, a little part of the story. During 2012, 13 and 14, every year, they looked more or less at 5,000 photos of dead people without recognizing faces on them, searching their child. He was a young boy, a public administrator, and administrator of empresas, well, businessman, mm -hmm. 24 years that he disappeared in a road between Monterrey and Laredo. No? So, I, I, I cried, really, and I wrote a letter to them. I read, but hearing that mother saying that she had to, to, to look the photos of all the people killed in the country in a way you can't imagine, you can see the faces sometimes, the bodies, things incredible, searching her son. And why doesn't the government do that, the police, the judges, who is in charge of the case, it's a case that has four years. Why must she do that? You understand, she's victimized, and so she's again victimized, and again all the time. It's incredible, the sadism. And there are, well, lots of these, I, uh, 
of these things, no? I mean, I think that's one of the most... Go, go ahead. No, no, you, 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 please. No, but some of the cases we were talking about before, I mean, I think that, that, that you know really well and that you all have documented, I mean, one of the most striking things is that a number of people who are targeted and become victims because they're standing up for family members who are victims. Yes. Like the Reyes Salazar family from Chihuahua who came yes. here and testified in December, or Sandra Luz Hernandez in, in Culiacan, Sinaloa, where we have a, a teaching project who was killed exactly one year ago yesterday, but killed for protesting the disappearance and murder of her son a year before. In other words, this is a sort of pattern of targeting victims, victims, family members, and then they're targeted again. And in the case of the Reyes Salazar family, it's like three generations of the family now. Yes, incredible. Uh, Sandra at 12 o'clock in the midday at four or five streets of the, uh, the Procuraduría. At the, the prosecutor's office. Yeah. Nepomuceno Moreno, a hero of our moment, a, a father, an example of what a father is, killed at 12 o'clock there in the center of Hermosillo, etc. But uh, I want to, ¿cómo se llama una vuelta de tuerca? I have the word, but I don't find. Well, I want to, I like that word, but I, I turn, turning point. Okay. I have my dictionary of, look, in this, what happened in Iguala last year, 26, 27, 26, 27 September, it's a, a new point in the story of war in the country. And it has some important questions in the sense of what can happen in this process, if there is a turning point in this process. There are many things. One, one uh, thing I want to put, because this is a peace school, it's very, it's the, perhaps in violence, the most important subject in a peace school is that in Iguala there was a genocide action. That's very important to understand, and here I know you understand what I'm speaking. The rector, rector? The, the, the chancellor is what we of say. Of the here. main university doesn't understand that category. But because I said it with him. But I think now we can speak. What happened in Iguala is a genocide action. I'm not saying Mexican government has a genocide politic. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, careful, because in Iguala, the order was everybody. They took 43, but if they took the 72, they would have disappeared the 72. That's a very important thing. More in a peace school, and nobody could, we must stop a moment and think a little bit more. And I put two questions that we can discuss after, because there is a lot with that, also in nonviolent struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing, uh, the students of the rural school of Ayotzinapa, very poor students, peasants, indigents, that will work with the most poor communities of the country all their lives, teaching. Uh, they have always been a selective target. They belong to the selective extermination in the country, to that level, always. The year before, the 12th December, the day of the Guadalupe Virgin, two of them were killed in the big road of, Aca of Acapulco, que, Cu 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 Cuernavaca, La Caseta. They were killed like this. They were asking money, the cars, and killed. Six, uh, eight months before. So the, but two of them. Here are 43, plus six free students and free people that walked in the street. So, first question. In Mexico, there is a change in politics against social activism? Because we passed from a selective target to a massive extermination. I, I we passed from a selective extermination to a massive extermination. 43 is a massive number, not selected. Because was 43, but the order was all. It was not catch 43, was all you can. 
Some of them could run, had a lot of luck, or God, I don't know, and others, no. So that first question is very important for knowing how we will struggle from nonviolence. We are in front of a change in the political government, first. Second question, important, for peace studies. Who gave the order? Listen, at 10 o'clock, the students, 10, 9 o'clock, were in the police, in an interrogation, interrogation, torture. And at 11 o'clock, they were, as the government says, taken to be burned. So in that hour, why the order changed? That's very important because it's a genocide order. If they would want to exterminate all of them, they wouldn't have taken them to the police office in cars of the police? Or you think that yes? No, the main error they did is to put them in the police cars. And the cameras of the street took that for the world. Because if that wouldn't have been taken, the situation would be in the social, in the moral force, completely different. So there was, that night, somebody that changed the order. But it's not a simple order, it's a genocide order in our country. Again, the very valuous people that are teachers, rural, peasant teachers. So this is why the government is expertise, the power, in making us think as uh, little boys, infantilizar. ¿Cómo se dice? Infantilize. Infantilize, but not in a, in a despective way, despectivo, for the boys, but for adults. Because we are all around the carrot, and it's very important this part of the carrot. They must be fined, the 43. That's very important. But the same of important, the same, is how it happened. Because if we don't know the process of how it happened, impunity is total. The government made a kind of telenovela, a, a story, a tale story. Mm -hmm. So proper. And yeah. There are almost anybody responsible. Very little responsibility. So they could, with the medias, build the idea that we must find the 43. It's a very also almost impossible work, but we must find. Excellent. But the problem is that nobody, we are not speaking about how it happened. That's a very little part now. It's not a main demand. And that really touches the heart of power and of impunity. How it happened. No? So, uh, well, no, let's talk because otherwise it's catechism because I can say too many things. Well, so. let, me, let me ask you something. You're, you're a historian by training. I'm a historian. And we keep talking about this as something, we keep talking about what's new about this, right? You said a new, a new kind of capitalism, a new kind of violence, a turn towards from something that was selective to genocidal, all things that indicate change over time. And yet you have written a lot about the connection between previous patterns of- What? Previous patterns, padrones de represión ah. in Mexico, no? Yeah. Um, and so I, so I want to ask you, what do you think the, what do you think is the connection between um, the, a, a recent past of repression and what do you think is really new and why is it appearing now? From the government view? No, from, from the view of this, this new, a different, a qualitatively different kind of violence yeah. that we've seen in the last 10 years. And, and, and so on the one hand, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say about the continuity there from previous kinds of, of violence and repression. Uh, but on the other hand, why you think we're seeing something different now? 
Well, uh, in, the, in the way of building a good principle of reality, we are speaking about hypotheses. It's very dangerous to say it's like this, because it's a very changing all the time situation and territories. 2011, I worked in Juarez City. It was the most dangerous city in the world, number one. And I lived in Cuernavaca, a very peaceful city. Now Cuernavaca is the 50 city more dangerous in the world. And Juarez is security for them in their numbers. So territories and bodies change very quickly. And if you don't have a good principle of reality, you must think that you fight against something and you are in another situation and you can make uh, mistakes in the way of nonviolent struggle that in our situation can be dangerous or not having any result. In that sense, I say the, the question is the main question and it's an important thing for peace studies, for social sciences to understand process. And we have uh, elements important. We have a lot of political prisoners that has been increased a lot in the last months, all for struggles for uh, natural resources, water, a mine, a, a gas, a woods, no? but a lot of very also uh, impunity cases for example, the, one of the most important. In Mexico, uh, I go to your question, no? I, <laughs> in Mexico, there has been a very hard, four massive cries of social society in the last four years. That's important to understand. Not in all societies, there are four massive cries, 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 gritos, shouts with that intensity in so short time. The first one, well, the first main is the Zapatistas cry in 94. Uh, well, I have the word, stop enough, how is it? Yabasta. Yabasta. Mm -hmm. Stop. The second, with Javier Sicilia and family victims, March 2011, we are fed up. The third, students, May 2012, I am 132. It's a very massive, for democracy, not for war. But the third in the last times. The fourth is now with Ayotzinapa, that is, was, this, was the state, no? Give them us alive. But the third, it's very important, is of self-defenses in Michoacán that they said no more. 2013, February. And who was ahead of this was Dr. Uh, Joseph Mireles. Very important story, person, a, a doctor uh, from a community little where every woman was being raped and lots of violent stories. After 12 years, they said no more. And other groups of Michoacan and zones near started practicing the self-defense armed. Armed, no? Yeah. Okay, okay. Dr. Mireles is in jail. He's in jail. And you know what they said to, he was eating chicken in a restaurant. The police came and said, you have in your camioneta? In your truck, yeah. Your truck, you have drugs. And they put a bolsa bag mm -hmm. with some drugs. And he's there in a very far away. He's in Sonora, in Hermosillo, not in Michoacan, very far, because that is one of the main tactics of power in violence. Put the prisoners far away from their families. So everybody must first search money for going to visit him. It's poor people. And afterwards, you imagine lawyers, uh, distances is a very complex way, so everybody starts defending prisoners and the struggle 
goes down because there are no bodies for struggling, because there are prisoners. That's a main tactic in Mexico. So in that sense, there are a lot of other cases of the Jackie group in Sonora, Morelos, a woman, I know her, Enedina Rosas, 65 years. She defended, she's an indigent leader of a little, little community from my state, Morelos and Puebla, where he's going to pass a, a gas line that is going to put one east to west in the country, for making it simple. She's in prison more than one year. They say she stole one cellular to a policeman. A woman of 65 years, more than one year in jail for stealing one. They, they were blocking a street, something. She wasn't even in the block of the street, but she was a leader. So they took her, they said she was fighting against the police. They said, you stole this telephone, jail. That's increased a lot. But the important question in, in you is this. OK, one tactic is jail to social activists. There is another big tactic that is building laws that don't work, <laughs> laws that don't have a reglamento. Uh, uh, regulations, yeah. Or institutions that really work, or institutions without money for working. That's another tactic. But there is another one, and that's the question, to whom doesn't stop with jail? For example, students of Ayotzinapa, young students. They don't stop with jail. The medicine will be higher in violence because this case is like that. I told you that the last four months of 2013 in Guerrero State, I have the list, I send it to you by post, they were killed 20 social activists. And the midday, not situations hidden, nobody is in jail, nothing. So yes, why? Because the government finishes the time, three years more, three and a half years, and there is no money because the petrol money with the, the prices of petrol went down, no? So all the project, capitalistic project of national resources to the big transnational capital must run up more quickly. That's completely clear. Those are the social resistance local, no? People in the towns resisting the minorities the gas, the water. In, in that sense is where the question is, they have few time. Something that happened with Iguala is they don't have legitimacy. That's a very important thing to understand in Mexican moment. The government doesn't have a moral force in a social massive way. Even if the media, everybody speaks, but uh, the, the touch they received is too hard. And they are not able to arrange it. They can say it, but they are not able to arrange it. And that's very important because when power doesn't have moral force, legitimacy, it has the other weapon that is material force. Because they don't have 10 weapons, they have two. Moral force, legitimacy, consent, or material force, repression. So, of course, the situation, the Mexican situation, is changing in a very quickly way to other roads. No? But also civil society in the struggle. And that's a very important thing. Well, so, so let, let me ask you two, so two things, and you pick which one you want to start with. Um, the first thing is, it's, I think, very important for this audience. Mm. And, and yes, it's, it's similar to the to the question before about the history, but in, let me tell you why. It's this question of um, whether there is something about, uh, about modern Mexico itself that is violent. And it's something that you hear, not just in the US, Paco Ignacio Taibo uh, was talking on HBO the other day, and he talked about a cultura de la muerte in Mexico. 
and he, you know, a culture of death, and used examples from the Mexican Revolution and photographs, and talked about uh, El Día de los Muertos, and and it's something that you know, as a historian, this is something that we bristle against. We're looking for specificity for the process, as you say, right? I'm trying to get that right. So, if you could talk a little bit about that, about what, about how, how, when it's okay, you think to use historical examples, and what you think is really. What do you think changed? And, and the other reason I ask you that is because you have done research and published a lot of things about, for example, the murder of political activists in Mexico in the 1980s. Pietro is one of the people who's documented better than anybody else the systematic killing of social activists and political activists in Chiapas and in southern Mexico in the 1980s and 90s, something that's been totally forgotten, I think, by most of the historians. So we're dealing with something new, but there's something old there too, no? What is it? Well, the selective target killing is part of the political culture in Mexico. And you have thousands of books, researches that you can explain. Power in a cycle, cyclicamente, in some social struggles, eliminates some kind of social activist leaderships to make the base understand what's going to happen and for negotiating. That's a constant of our story. The problem is when that constant goes up and changes the dynamic. It's what I'm trying to say with this thing in Iguala and with other situations of prisoners, that it's not a, a, a less problem. Okay. Uh, but uh, I think it's not good to have that simple image of Mexico as a violent country and nothing like that. Mexico is a country full of life love, every corner, every way. For that, I was born in another country. I have 33 years in Mexico. I'm Mexican and I don't move there. Happens what happens. So uh, what we must understand is that it's a very much important, the struggle for life and the social resistance, that it's important now, and it's important to share. And uh, of course, we have got inside in a very high level process of war between citizens in every corner and between national capital inside of the country. And as they say in Oaxaca, uh, you take the money and we put the dead people, no? It's what people, one of the common sentences of uh, indigent communities, no? And poor communities. Dead people come from the poor, most poor places and uh, there is a, a very, very gigantesque increasing of money and of ganancias. Because what we are speaking of is of a big business, not of cruelty or sadism or bodies cut. No, no, no. We are speaking of business. That's the main problem. And in a country completely full of unemployment, of a, a model, an economical model that increases all the out, outside capital, etc., and that all the national resources are given I live in a city, for example, I have a boycott against Costco. I, and McDonald's and Nike also, but Costco. Directly in my city. I was in jail for Costco, 2002. What happened? The, the mayor of the city and the council of the city gave the, the principal land of a city without green land, Cuernavaca, public, gave it as a gift to Costco to put a mega, okay, tienda. Yeah, yeah, a warehouse, yeah, store, yeah. That happens, but we said that's the head of the iceberg in 2001. Now you should see my city, is a city with more malls in comparison with the number of citizens of the country. It's ridiculous, a city with, let's say, 20 malls with less than one million uh, citizens. 
ridiculous. That's washing money. That's an illegal thing. Well, this is multiplied in a very hard way, but not only in the, that's one of the situations in Mexico. There are two kinds of, of struggles and of victims. One are the individual victims of this uh, delictive uh, criminal war. The other are the communitarian victims. The communitarian victims have two faces. One is rural, peasants, is the most important. And they have a lot of civil resistance. The other is urbana. Urban. Urban. That it has to, to be with more with big streets, uh, breaking old towns and green areas. But the rural situation is more deep because it's their way of life. In a city, we can change a house without any problem. But a person that the land is his mother, he can't change the house because his mother is there, the land. So uh, the deep problem in the rural areas is hard. For that, the civil resistance is in a way high of civil disobedience. That, does, that doesn't happen so much in the cities yet but are happening interesting things. So, and unfortunately, I think what, what we'll need to do is close the formal session here and continue the discussion. Uh, we have a reception outside in the rotunda where we have some food and drinks and we can continue the discussion informally. But if everyone would please join me in, in, in thanking Pietro Amelio. Please come and see us.